Good evening, everyone. Great to be with you uh, again. And I count it a privilege to be able to share what David described as the gospel, the good news about the forgiveness of sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. So to do that, I want to turn our attention to the Bible and read two verses in the Old Testament and then a little story that was told by the Lord Jesus in the New Testament. And we'll try and learn some lessons from these scriptures. I want to read in the book of Proverbs, chapter 8. Proverbs 8, and we'll read verse 13. It says, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Here's the part of the verse that interests me tonight. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech. This is God speaking. He says, I hate. You just take the first and the last part of that verse. Pride and arrogance, God says, I hate. To make it really small, God says, pride, I hate. When you turn to chapter 16 of the same book, the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, verse 5. says the following everyone who is arrogant in heart that is anyone who's proud it says everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the lord be assured he will not go unpunished talking about the same thing a person who's pride is proud has pride in their heart he says that's an abomination to God. And in fact, he says, be assured, that person will not go unpunished. Now, that's the background to what I want to speak to you about that's found in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 18, where the Lord Jesus himself is speaking. And this is a great story that he told, and it's found in Luke chapter 18, starting at verse 9 says he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves. In other words, there were people around him who were listening and they trusted in themselves and what they thought of themselves, that they were righteous, that they were right with God. So this is the story he tells to people who think they're OK, that all's well and that they're OK before God. This is what he says. He says, two men went up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee. Now, a Pharisee was a man, very religious in a sect of Judaism, extremely uh, religious, strict, tried to stay away from anything that was evil and follow the, the Bible and the traditions and very serious about it all. So that religious man, a man trying to do the best he can not to stay away from what's bad, he goes up to the temple to pray. But then it says the other one who went up to the temple to pray was a tax collector. And tax collectors in those days had a bad reputation because they all did the same thing. They charged more taxes than what people owed to pocket, to put in their own pockets. They were unjust, they were corrupt, and everybody knew what they were like. So you have a bad man, people knew were a bad, was a bad man, and one who people considered to be a good man, and they both go up to the same temple to pray. Now we're going to see what happens. It says then in verse 11, the Pharisee, the religious man, standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing afar off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. Did you hear that? The man who was this well-known bad man, the corrupt man, the sinful man, that man went down to his house justified right with God. That's the shocker in the story for people. And he says, rather than the other, 
For everyone, here's the principle. Everyone who exalts himself, is proud, will be humbled. And then he adds, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, that's all I want to read. We've read two verses in the Old Testament, a story in the New Testament about the subject of pride. Now, I mentioned I was going to talk about how you could have your sins forgiven, the good news. But when we talk about sins, very often if you ask people about sins, the first thing they'll think about is maybe murder. And murder is sin. In fact, in the Bible, we find that the death penalty was given in the law. <laughs> and before that, before even the Ten Commandments, for someone who takes another person's life. So God takes that very seriously because, because sin, because life is precious, and that sin, people will be held accountable for taking the life of another. And in fact, if you go to all the way to the end of the Bible, the list of people who will not be in heaven, the list of people who will be punished forever includes murderers. But sometimes people will say, well, if they don't think about murder, they'll think about maybe sexual immorality adultery fornication whatever word you want to use and they'll say you know somebody that that's involved in some kind of something like that actually you know what the bible says that god himself he says god will judge he will personally take up the responsibility to carry out judgment on adulterers and sexually immoral people so that's serious sin There's no question about it but what about pride because you see, there, there could be people who are listening in today and you have committed murder. I do want to say to you, if that's you, there is forgiveness for you from God. Or maybe you have committed adultery. You've been unfaithful to your spouse. You have been sexually immoral. Can I tell you there's forgiveness for you too? But I want to just kind of focus in today on specifically the issue of pride. We might not think that Pride, we think, well, pride is not that, not that nice, but it's not that bad. What does God think? That's the question. What does God think? Pride, I hate, he says. He says, everyone who is a proud in heart, who is arrogant, is an abomination to the Lord. And in fact, he says in chapter 6, he gives a list of six things the Lord hates, seven are an abomination to him. And number one on the list is a proud look. In other words, pride is something that is a specifically and immensely offensive to God. It's something that's an abomination. He hates pride, proudful heart, pride in our thoughts. He absolutely, it is something that disgusts him, that revolts him, and it offends him. Pride. It's something that he says, be assured, the proud person will not go unpunished. Now, is that true? Why is that? Well, for example, do you know that Satan was once, he was made by God, and he was like the highest of the angels, the most beautiful. And yet he was cast out of heaven. And in fact, Jesus said that the lake of fire was actually made for the devil and his angels. Why did God respond? What did he do that was so bad that God threw him out of heaven and prepared a burning lake of fire for him to suffer in forever? He did not kill anybody. He did not commit sexual immorality. He did not steal. Ezekiel chapter 28 tells us that God speaks to him, and what he says is, you are proud in your heart. Pride in the heart was enough for God to cast him out of heaven and to create a place called the lake of fire where he will burn forever. Because pride is that serious. You can see it in the life of King David in the Old Testament. Perhaps you know this story. That awful story of how he was unfaithful to his wife and he, he committed adultery. 
and then he participated and organized a murder. The consequences of that were that one person died. One person died. It's actually his own child. That child is in heaven, like all children who die. But that child, and it, it hurt him deeply. But later on in his life, God told him as a king, do, do not ever take a census. I don't want you thinking that you've been some successful thing by yourself and that you're a successful man. And for you to be lifted up in pride. So don't even take a census of how many people you have and how many soldiers and all your wealth. You just keep your eyes focused on God. But one day, David, he took a census of his people. And what does the Bible say? Be assured the proud person will not go unpunished. And when he was when he committed adultery and murder, well, we could say one or two people as a consequence of his sin died. But when he committed pride, when he expressed that pride in the census that he took, 70,000 people died. You see, we need to adjust our thinking to the way God thinks. It is not to minimize the loss of life or the loss of purity. Those are horribly awful sins in the sight of God that will bring consequences. But pride in the heart is something that God hates. It is an abomination to the Lord. And we can see that very clearly. C.S. Lewis, he once said that it is, pride is the essential vice. It is the utmost evil. And he was right. And the Lord Jesus said that, didn't he? In the passage we read in the New Testament, he said, whoever exalts himself, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. God will see to it that they are brought down. Be assured he will not go unpunished. And now what is pride? Well, you can find lots of definitions, but I just want to be simple. It's an assertion of self. Uh, self. Sometimes it comes out in the form of, this is what I think I deserve. This is my right. A seeking of self. I want a vanity of getting people to look at self and to uh, admire self and conceit to think that I'm better in myself than other people and arrogance that other people have to do what I tell them to do because it's me. There's all different forms of it all, but it's all pride. The assertion of self, whoever exalts himself, Jesus said, their own way, their own thinking, that person will not go unpunished. But here we are to talk about the gospel tonight. And so I want to come to look at the two issues in the story that Jesus told. Sin and salvation. And I want to try and show you how pride can come in to both of those points and could be keeping you out of heaven and could doom you to an eternity where the devil is going to be according to the Bible, because whoever exalted himself will be brought low. God resisted the proud. The Bible is very clear that pride is a very serious sin. So think with me for a few minutes about the issue of pride when it comes to the issue of sin. So for example, Jesus is talking to people who thought they trusted in themselves that they were righteous. So they asserted their own view of themselves and they chose to be content with themselves. Their own evaluation. So he tells a story about two men who go to a temple to pray. One man is humble. One man exalts himself. One man humbles himself. One man exalts himself. One man went home saved, right with God. One man did not. Now notice the difference. The man who went to the temple, notice, notice how he exalts himself. First, he says, God. He says, I am not. And he begins to give his self-evaluation, present his view of himself. Can I tell you that that is grossly proud? Who are you and who am I? To be able to evaluate ourselves spiritually, what we are truly like. You see, physicians and medical people will tell you that there are patients they come in and they come into a hospital or the emergency room or a doctor's office and they've already evaluated themselves. Why? They have 
perhaps consulted with Dr. Google and they, they have their own self-diagnosis and they come in and they, they know what they have. How many people have said, I, I, I have a high temperature and I, 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 I'm feeling kind of shivers and I, I have a fever, but I think it's just a, it's just a flu. Or I think it's just a cold. They, they evaluated themselves only later to find out they had COVID. You see, self-evaluation, well, physically you might be right, but spiritually it is a sign of pride when we go before God like this man did and he said, God, I want to tell you what I think of myself. How did the other man, the man who was right, became right with God, the man who got saved, the man who was justified, the man who was going to go to heaven, how did he value himself? He just goes before God and he says, God, I want to take your evaluation of me. I don't want you to take my evaluation of me. I want to get your evaluation. That's what counts. I am going to humble myself. And it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I feel. I am going to be in agreement with your evaluation of what I am like, of who I am, of what I have done. The people who do that, do that, who are willing to take God's side, who are willing to be in agreement with God about their spiritual condition and their spiritual activities and their sin, those are the people who are going to become right with God. But it's not easy. So the one man comes and he says, I want to go with my evaluation. The other man comes to God and he says, I accept your evaluation. You'll notice that the first man came and when it came to sin, he not only gave his own evaluation, but his standard was uh, comparing himself with others. He says, I am not as other men are, unjust. And he goes on to list some people there. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not like that man over there, that tax collector. I don't defraud people. I don't rob. He compared himself with other people. How, how arrogant. How, how much pride is there in the human heart? When we stand before God and we say, you know, I really don't think I'm that bad. After all, I know somebody who did this. My uncle, my father, my sister, my husband, my parents. You see, we evaluate each other ourselves by comparing ourselves with other people. Like students who go home and they say to their parents, well, I got a C minus on that exam. But, but it was hard. Everybody said it was hard. And everybody did poorly on the test, as if somehow that's going to help. You see, the reality is, this man went before God comparing himself with others. And he wasn't going to be right with God. And he wasn't going to have his sins forgiven. And he wasn't going to go to heaven. The man who was saved, who received salvation, who was justified, who was right with God, who had forgiveness, notice the difference. He comes before God and he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He said, I take God's evaluation of me. I am a sinner and I mean it the way God means it. Every way that God talks about it, that's the way I'm talking about it. God, be merciful. Me, a sinner, not a good sinner, not a church going sinner, not a kind person who has sinned. Not, not, a, not an even-keeled person. Not a noble sinner. Me, a sinner. So let me ask you today. Is there pride in your heart when it comes to the issue of your spiritual condition before God? I know there was in mine before I got saved. I did not want to fully accept. I knew the language that all are sinners. And somehow I kind of felt comfortable with that. And I, I knew what to kind of say to to say, well, we're sinners, and I would even say the words that I was a sinner, but I wasn't truly convinced in my heart that God was right. So let me just give you a little bit of a test here, and let me give you some, some words in the Bible to describe you that God uses to give you his viewpoint of yourself. So if you're not saved today, the Bible says you are an un- Believer, a person who has not believed. If the first thing inside your heart is to say, I do believe, I'm just not saved, you're asserting yourself and you are not taking God's position. I know I was there, I did that. 
I would say I know the gospel. I know about Jesus. I know about the death on the cross. I can quote the Bible verses and I know I believe, but I'm not saved. God says, if you're not saved, no, you don't believe. Because if you did believe, you would be saved. So Bible word is unbeliever. And you can see how there's that pride, that assertion of self. Let me give you another word. How about the word wicked? You say wicked. That, that's a wicked word. That's a, that's a big time word. It's to say I've sinned is one thing, but to say I'm wicked, that's a Bible word. To say that I'm a, that my heart is sinful, I, I don't know about that. You see, that's, that's the assertion of self. Where we want to convey uh, and convince ourselves that we are not what God says we are. Let me give you one more word. How about the word lost? You see, that's a Bible word that God uses to describe us. That we are lost. Helpless. That we can't change our condition. You see, the man who went before God and he said, I, I've got some abilities. I've got some good qualities. I'm not what other people think I have. This is my evaluation. That man was never going to be in heaven. The only person in the story he's going to get saved. The only person who's going to be right with God is the man or the woman or the boy or the girl who is willing to take God's view to abandon all pride, to humble themselves, not exalt themselves, but to humble themselves and to take God's viewpoint and say, God, I'm a lost, wicked, unbelieving. I'm a sinner. Let me give you some Bible verses quickly to test you. What do you think when you hear these words? That we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses, our best works are as filthy rags. How about the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked? See, that sounds like the description of some really awful people, doesn't it? But that's the way God's describing you and me. And you see, every person who gets God's salvation comes to the point where they humble themselves. And they abandon pride. Isaiah, the great preacher in the Old Testament, he just said, I'm a man of unclean lips. Peter, what did he say? He said, I'm a sinful man. That son came back, that prodigal son in Luke 15. What did he say? He said, I, I have sinned in heaven before heaven. And it, and, and I am no longer worthy to be called a son. I don't deserve to be even a servant. I don't deserve anything. I am lost. I am wicked. I am unbelieving. Even the great apostle Paul said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. But he said, of whom I'm chief, I'm the bottom of the barrel. I'm the worst. I take my place the way God sees me. I'll never forget the night that I got saved because that was the first time in my life where I took God's side. And I tell you, it was so uncomfortable, it was frightening to realize, to abandon pride and see what I am. But it's necessary because he that humbles himself, it's the only way to become right with God is to have God's view of our sin. But I want you to think with me about salvation now. This is the great news. Notice the difference between these men. The one man comes and he has pride in his plan of salvation. What is it? His plan is all about his sacrifices and what he has done. He says, I give tithes. I give 10% of all my earnings. He says, I fast every Monday and every Thursday. He would take two days from dusk till dawn where he would go without food. I'm making sacrifices and I'm giving. You see, his salvation plan involved the exertion of self and the assertion of self. It involved pride. It involved him. Any plan of salvation that involves you will never save your soul. It's just the exaltation of self. And God says people who exalt themselves, even in the plan of salvation, will be brought low. They'll be punished. They'll never be in heaven. And they'll never be saved. So that's why tonight, my friend, we're not here to tell you about how you need to improve yourself what church you need to go to, how you need to be baptized, how you need to give, how you need to change, how you need to do something, because it's not about the assertion of self. It's realizing what you are before God 
And notice the other man. What did he do? There's no assertion of self in his way of salvation. His plan of salvation is this. He just calls out to God and he says, God, be merciful. God, you come up with a plan. God, I'm going to trust you to do something to solve this problem of my sin because I'm just a sinner. You've got to do everything. Find a sacrifice. Make a sacrifice. Provide a sacrifice for my sin because I cannot do anything about my sin. And that man went home that day justified because he was not only taking God's view of himself, he was taking God's plan for himself, God's salvation, that God would provide a sacrifice, a payment for his sin. He humbled himself, abandoned all attempts to get his include himself somehow and his salvation. And it was all about God and the sacrifice that God would provide. You know, the amazing thing in that story is the man who was telling the story. He was actually the man telling the story. He would become the sacrifice. God's sacrifice. God would once offer him up as a, as a sin offering for us all. God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The man who was telling that story. And the man in the story realized, I've got to, I have to depend. If I want to be right with God, it's, not, it's all going to be found in the quality of the sacrifice that God will provide. The man who told the story would provide that sacrifice. Not as he told it there at the temple. Outside the temple of Jerusalem, outside the city of Jerusalem, when they hung him on a cross, he had been beaten. He had been, been whipped. He had had a crown of thorns on him. He had been mistreated, spit upon, mocked. But when he was on the cross, God made him a sacrifice. That's the good news of the Bible. It's not about what you do for God to take care of your sins. It's what God has done for you, what God has done for me. He has provided a sacrifice that is perfect, that is sufficient. And on that cross, the Lord Jesus shed his precious blood. And he, Christ loved us and he gave himself for us. He suffered for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. So today, here's the good news. If you're willing to abandon your pride, humble yourself, God will give you the salvation of your soul. He will forgive all of your sin. And today, you could go to your house, or if you're in your house, you could stay in your house, or you could share with everybody in your house, or you can open your window and you could shout out of your house that you're forgiven through the Lord Jesus, God's sacrifice provided for people who are willing to take their place the way God describes them as sinners before God. So you will either be one who humbles themselves and you will receive salvation. Or you will exalt yourself and you will continue to assert yourself, your opinions, your ideas, your thoughts, your evaluation, your plan, your thoughts of how salvation should come about. Or you will abandon it all because you will either be in heaven or you will be with the proud one, the devil himself. The choice is yours. The provision is made. God's plan is available. And our hope and prayer is that today you will respond to the Bible and you'll respond to God's word and God's son. And you'll put your faith all in him and have the forgiveness of your sins and go to your home justified today like the man in this story. Thank you very much for your attention. And our prayer is that today will be the day, the great day, a super day when you will have the forgiveness of all your sins. Thank you very much.